Greetings, aviators. This is Quincy at GD Viperworks, and it is now March 26th. It's time for a long overdue update on the Sim Pit. A couple things I want to talk about first. Let's talk about the multi threading. I did add a uh, NVIDIA 4090 graphics card into the simulator, it runs great. Uh, I think I'm a little bit bottlenecked by my processor, however but it runs a lot smoother than my old 3080 Ti. Right here on Persian Gulf, I'm getting about 86 frames per second. And um, this is without the multi-threading. Multi-threading did come out recently. It is still in beta. Uh, I have tested it. Initially, there were some huge problems that led to me not using it at all. And that involved all my display ports all of my external screens that I have inside the cockpit, they were um, all glitching. They weren't, it's like they weren't uh, clearing any images off the screen and they would just project a new one. So it was a blob of, of color or blobs of anywhere that uh, any information was projected. It just never erased. So that was completely undoable. There was a, um, a, walk, a workaround that somebody had posted that fixed a couple of the screens. Uh, it did fix the um, MFDs, and I found a way to use the same code to fix the EHSI, uh, but I couldn't fix my RWR. So I stopped using that until they put out a patch that fixed that. I'm still not using multi-threading, though, because there's another glitch with it. And you're not going to see it right here because I'm not multi-threading. But um, while it did double my frame rates, I'm getting about 150 frames uh, solid with the multi-threading. But the problem is it's creating a, um, like a line right down the middle of my screen. And it's a shadow. And when I go into a bank, I can see this weird like shadow line projecting across the ground. It's very distracting, and therefore, until they fix that, I'm not interested in multi-threading. But for now, even though the frame rates are, you know, 70 or 80, um, they uh, this is a lot smoother than it was before. The the um, number of frames or how fast it makes those frames uh, is a lot faster than my 3080. Another item that I've already talked about. I made a uh, video of fly and chat with Quincy and I didn't actually show the product here because I was actually showing my in-screen view. Uh, this is the AIM XYZ. It's a new camera. Um, it is camera based. It is facial recognition. Unlike a track IR which I had previously, the track IR, um, as most of you don't already know, that it, um, it uses infrared light and tracks with the camera tracks the infrared light or a reflection of the infrared light depending on which method you use. If you use the the actual infrared lights that were on your headset uh, it would use that and if you use the reflectors it would use that. Well this unfortunately downside does not have infrared light so there's only one limitation to this thing uh, if you're flying in a dark room and you're flying at night you don't have a lot of light reflecting back onto your face then it doesn't see your face well enough to be able to um, to move and track your your facial movements in your head as you look around the cockpit or outside. So that is one detractor to this system, but is a lot slimmer than the uh, Track IR, and it worked beautifully right out of the box. So I'm really loving this. I just wish that they would put it out with some sort of infrared. Uh, emitter maybe with an infrared camera so that can see your face in the dark now we've already talked about my RWR before um, but I've added my threat warning prime I had some uh, new old stock of aerospace optics push-button switch indicators and I managed to put a lot of work into these guys to make my threat warning prime or TWP these all work if a missile is launched at me you will see the red launch indication and it'll be perfectly synced with the screen um, these are a little bit finicky though if i hit target separation well there's nothing on the screen right now so it's not going to do it but um, priority latched there 
Sometimes it's a little finicky, but it works. There, there it goes. It's a little, little rough sometimes, but it works. It'll switch. And um, what I did with those, I had to pull out the whole guts of the caps and replace the 28 volt um, incandescent bulbs. I found some five volt bulbs that would fit in there. I replaced those. And then um, if you look around the channel, you'll see some posts about cutting new lenses and new uh, legends to place inside of these. It required the CNC, some paint, the laser. So um, they were CNC cut with clear acrylic. The, um, the faces, the white faces here like launch, that was CNC milled out system test, etc., filled with paint, and then the back sides were reverse engraved with laser for the legends that you see lit up from behind in green. I tried a few things to try and light those up. One idea that I thought would be pretty good was um, to use modeling paint, uh, transparent modeling paint, and paint the lenses. Well, I tried that, but the problem is that the paint was pretty inconsistent so it left some darker and lighter spots. So I figured, let's try painting the bulbs. It would be a little more consistent that way. Well, it was fine, but the bulbs, uh, as you place them into the very tight slots they went into, it scraped the paint off the bulbs. So the last thing I tried was uh, theater lighting gels. Very thin, very cheap. Cut them to size, folded them over, and attached them to the front faces of the bulbs. I could probably put another layer in there. They are pretty bright, but otherwise they're pretty darn good and cheap. So that's the uh, RWR, Threat Warning Prime. And as you can see, once again, perfectly reflected to what is in game and on the screen. Moving over to the right side console, I replaced a replica oxygen regulator with a real one. Now I don't plan on actually wiring this up somehow to get it to indicate anything or to get the switches to actually work or register in the simulation. We don't use it, we don't need it, doesn't really matter, but having the real thing there makes a huge difference in the look of the cockpit in general. So that is just one of those subtle differences, very much like having the, the proper um, switch guards and the shrink fit uh, square caps. All that stuff really makes a big difference when you look inside the cockpit. I also have another one of my creations to share with you. You've already seen it in different forms on my channel, but here's a close up. Let's talk about it a little bit. Here is my EHSI. Built this thing from scratch. You could see the uh, the screen boards back there with the HDMI. You can kind of see the basics of the design of how I put that together. It's almost like a T-shape. It has a flat panel to mount the uh, circuit board onto. And then that HDMI goes down here to an HDMI to USB converter and then into my hub. The only downside to this thing is it's a very high resolution screen, unfortunately. It's like 1600 by 1440 for this size. I mean, this, this RWR here is 480 by 480. And um, I'll attach a, a photo. You'll see how much processing power this little screen requires um, compared to the other screens and their sizes relatively. So it takes a lot of power to push the pixels to this little screen, and I'm going to probably redo it with a lower resolution screen. It's been a little bit finicky, probably because of that reason, but otherwise, it works. It works 100%. So right now, I do have the autopilot on, and it is on heading mode, which you can also see, of course, is reflected right here. Autopilot on, altitude hold. Heading select. It is tracking the heading bug. So if we take a look here, we'll go to uh, heading on this side. We'll turn the heading. 
and you'll see the HSI start to turn because the aircraft is starting to turn. And just off the screen, the HSI on the screen is turning, of course. But you can see there that that works. I could turn the heading both ways, no problem there. And then this is my course select for my HSI. Turns nicely. Both directions. I could change the brightness. Press, see the bright indication. And while that's up, I can dim it or brighten it as needed. There's a push button here for the uh, mode. So I could change it to TACAN or ILS or NAV. And it works great when it's actually displaying. It works great. So hopefully I'll get that worked out to be a little more reliable. But um, it's another one of the little creations. It took me weeks. And I've been generally very happy with it. You know, sometimes to do something yourself and design it yourself, um, it's really rewarding. And that's one of the things about this hobby is um, coming up to all these pitfalls and then figuring out how to get over them. So, very rewarding. But that's my EHSI. Soon I'll be filling in some of the other components here. If anyone has any good solutions, for DCS at least, for the primary instruments, please let me know because um, I need to fill in this instrument panel. And now the very last thing that I want to talk about that I've decided to change. Currently, I'm using Arduino boards to power all of these functions in here. And the Arduinos I'm using, mostly Megas, they have a lot of slots, uh, a lot of pins that I can program, so those are very good. I'm also using some Nanos and some Unos, but they use a certain chipset that kind of limits me to do something that, um, that I would rather do. Um, and that involves programming all of these switches, much like any of these commercial products, like that Win Wing Throttle, which again, I'm still waiting for the Sim Gears one, or the ICP or the real simulator stick. And just like any of the others, you're all very familiar with going into DCS and binding all of your switches to the proper functions or whatever function that you want them to do. And that's a Windows function. Those are USB HID or human interface devices. They're very reliable. And when they kick offline and they come back, they don't mess with your simulator. DCS BIOS does have a problem with it. They do occasionally kick offline and there's no way to recover it without actually closing DCS. Now, if you're, if you're in the middle of a, a squadron night and flying a mission, that's a no-go. So we can't have that. So the other issue is that once I bind these switches, as they are now, through DCS BIOS, the circuit boards that are beneath these have programs on them that are very specific to the F-16. And every switch is programmed very specifically for the name of that switch in the F-16. If I want to fly an F-18 in here, I can bind up my Win Wing, my real simulator, and my ICP, as well as my MFDs. I could, I could get all those to work. And my screens will work too, because those, will, um, those are programmed to export for the other aircraft. But the rest of this won't do anything for me. So it's kind of a waste. So now changing over the circuit boards to um, the Arduino uh, Leonardo's, Micro's, and Douay's. Those are basically the three sizes, small, medium, and large, that are the equivalents of the other three that I'm using now. Well, they, they have a different chipset that allows these things to be seen as joystick buttons um, or 
joysticks, hat switches, etc. And so using that makes this a lot more reliable and a lot more customizable because I can call this thing an F-18 and then I can program the equivalent switches for the equivalent functions of an F-18 in here. I just have to go into DCS and bind them. But I save the profile and that's it. I'm done. Now I could use it. Whereas DCS BIOS, that's not the case. So that's a huge benefit. I have, um, I've already wired up one panel as a test and that's my avionics panel. If we look underneath, you can see I have a board that's hanging there. That's a Pro Micro and it's on a breakout board and I did wire it up to go to my avionics. It's using the same exact wires. I only made a new harness because the old harness that goes over here to the mega board, which uses DCS BIOS, it's still there. So this is just an additional harness. So all I had to do is plug those in there, but the problem is um, programming. DCS BIOS is very easy. It might be intimidating at first to some people, but it's very easy. They have these um, code snippets that you copy, paste, and then you just tell it what pin number on your board that that switch is related to. It's very simple. Well, the downside to going with the uh, USB HID is I have to go into the Arduino IDE, same as I would with DCS BIOS, but I would have to use different libraries of information to code these switches. And they would have to be coded manually. And it's a lot more involved. And I don't have a background in C++ coding. So I'm, I'm having to, to learn it myself as much as I need. So that's what I've been doing. And that is my first test panel. And it works fantastic. I actually programmed this panel right here for an F-18 uh, the other night. So I do have that saved uh, for that as well. And I have found that it's, um, it's a lot more reliable. Any toggles of the switches are, are, uh, are they're better, um, especially these rotaries, these eight position and three position rotaries. Sometimes I'd get some bounce uh, under DS, uh, DCS BIOS and um, especially for your, your alignment, man, that's terrible for your nav alignment. If that thing bounces and you're doing a fast align, you wind up messing that up and now you have to do a full alignment. That's a lot of time. Well, I found that as fast as I turn these rotary selectors with um, as an HID, it tracks the switch much better and it doesn't bounce. So that is probably one of the biggest changes that I have to report to you and that I've been working on, aside from filling in all these holes. So it's getting to the point where filling a lot of these holes in, it, over time, it seems like it's such a small thing, but the problem is that it is much more involved uh, to fill up this little hole. Fill up the EHSI, the RWR, the TWP. So a lot more time has to go into these things. And yes, I, I really need that uh, Sim Gears TQS so that I can do all this. Still waiting. Man, I need that thing bad. Thanks for listening to me blabber on for the last 20 minutes or so. But hopefully that gets you up to date. Um, maybe gives you a few ideas and um, a couple things before I go I would really love to have a, a pretty cool logo for my uh, my page so if anyone's really good at art and um, is interested in drawing up some sort of icons that I could choose from uh, to represent the uh, the page that would be great so anyway guys thanks again for listening and Quincy out